Let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, the top issues that you, you folks are out there uh, door knocking and campaigning on. Uh, Lisa, we'll start with you once again. Well, first of all, what is your number one issue? If you win the election in November and you go down to St. Paul and represent the district uh, in, uh, in the new year, uh, what are some of the things that you really want to take on when you get there? Sure. Um, the three things that initially came to mind um, when I decided to run for this seat, um, first of all, equalizing the um, pre-K-12 education funding was important to me um, just because of my work on the school board. Second, of course, was a health care cost and accessibility. And then third is our workforce sustainability. With the low um, unemployment rate that we have, it's really difficult. My husband owns a part owner of a manufacturing company within our district. And to find skilled employees is a really a huge challenge for him and for other businesses. But out of those three, what I'm hearing most at the doors that affects all of the the people in the area is the health care cost. And so that's an area that I would really like to focus on. How can we bring those costs down? How can we make it accessible to all of Minnesota and um, just improving that? Yeah, it's a tough issue. I mean, it's something that uh, politicians have been trying to figure out for years. Right. Uh, but something has to be done because the soaring cost of health care is, is, is really a, a strain on most families. Right. Uh, Jim, talk a little bit about you. What are some of your top issues or concerns uh, that you would like to bring down to St. Um, Paul with well, you? Well, the first one will come as a great surprise, health care. Mm -hmm. uh, it is – ha I have more conversations about this than anything else. Uh, conversation will sometimes go like this. Um, I pay $40,000 in premiums and deductibles, and I can't afford to go to the doctor because that extra amount of money that you would have to pay to go in – deters many people from uh, doing the preventive work, the preventive uh, treatment that they should be doing. And so many people suffer, uh, and, and it's, uh, the system sends the wrong kinds of messages. So I have lots of conversations about that. Um, I tell people uh, if there was one thing that I would like to accomplish if elected would be to make progress on, toward universal health care coverage and uh, making costs affordable, uh, I say it's not easy to fix. If it were easy to fix, it would already have been fixed, but I'm not giving up on it. Okay. Uh, since neither one of you were in uh, mm -hmm. St. Paul during the last legislative session, I'm curious to see what you guys think about how it all kind of ended. There was a huge omnibus bill that mm -hmm. got passed in the, the final hours. It was like a thousand pages or close to it. Ends up getting uh, quickly vetoed mm -hmm. by uh, Governor Dayton. Uh, Talk a little bit about, uh, Jim, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were down there, what would you yeah. maybe have done differently so that we didn't have that, uh, well, that situation? We, we have to change our process so that it becomes uh, not a game of chicken between the two parties. Uh, we have a very partisan process, and that 892-page uh, omnibus bill was a classic example of how we should not be legislating in Minnesota. So the, the Republicans passed this 892-page uh, bill with all sorts of things, many, about half of them things that the two parties could have worked out and agreed upon, the other half that were essentially a partisan wish list. They then dared Governor, v uh, Governor Dayton to veto it. He vetoed it. So there's your train wreck. There's your game of chicken. I don't claim that either side is innocent in this, but I will say – if I am elected to the legislature, I will insist within my own caucus and insist of people on, on the other party that those things that we can work out, that we can agree upon, should be treated separately. We should get those things, vote on them, work them out, uh, get them passed early or to the middle of the session, and at least we will that, that way accomplish 50 percent rather than having putting everything in this sort of all-or-nothing High stakes political game. That means the rest of us are all are caught as pawns in this big high stakes political game, and it's been happening from both sides. Uh, I think it's bad. It contributes to the polarization and the cynicism of our politics. And if elected, I will do it, whatever's in my power to try to change that process. Lisa, talk a little bit about your thoughts or your reaction to how the session ended this last year. I was surprised a little bit how it ended um, with the, the veto that came through. I know there were some things in that bill that would have benefited all Minnesotans. And it's unfortunate um, that those weren't carried through um, because I've never been in this position yet and I haven't um, been – directly um, able to work on those things. I would like to see more work throughout the entire session um, 
to bring things to a point that it wouldn't be that last minute. But I understand that that no one was sitting back just waiting till the very end. They were working from the very beginning, and I hope to do that also. Talk about some of the issues that uh, were brought up during the last legislative session. Maybe didn't get uh, all that far. Uh, talk about uh, gun control issues. Uh, Lisa, we'll start with you. Uh, if you go down there and uh, some bills start to pop up, which I'm sure they will, having to do with uh, regulation of guns, uh, what would your uh, position be on that? Sure. I fully support the Second Amendment rights, um, safe gun ownership. I come from a family of hunters, um, and as long as it's done safely, um, with the background checks, I fully support that. I know Minnesota um, has, I think it was the Gifford Law Center that um, gave us a top rating where we um, are doing a great job. Could things look, be looked at and improved? Always. I think always it could. But there's the other mental health piece to that that I think a lot of times when I'm at the door, what I'm hearing is the gun issue and then people flip into school safety. And I don't know if that's because of the time of year with school just getting back in session. Um, I know there were some dollars that were allocated for sa school safety grants. And I think that's a very important thing. But part of that also is the mental health piece that we need to address. Well, And you probably can address that uh, specifically if you've been a long term uh, school board member. Sure. Or Corey, uh, do you have the funding you need uh, to assess the students and uh, their mental state of mind? Uh, we, there's been improvements over the last three years on that for us. Um, do we have enough? Not yet. I think our teachers and our counselors are that first line of defense. I have, I happen to have a daughter that's a teacher, an elementary school teacher, um, in outstate or more toward the metro area, not exactly right in our area in Recori, but, um, the teachers and those in our schools, the support staff, those are the ones that are seeing our students and know what they're facing and maybe can see some um, concerns. And so I think if we additionally can allocate some dollars toward that piece of it, it's going to help. Jim, how about you? Uh, talking about gun control mm -hmm. and any laws or changes that could be made mm -hmm. at the state level, where would you stand mm -hmm. on some of that? I see if I'm elected as a representative that I have two duties. One is to respect the Constitution, which includes the Second Amendment, and the other is to do everything in my power to protect the life, liberty, and property of the people who voted me in and their families. I believe that you have to do both of those things. I don't see them as being contradictory. I believe I have to do both of those things. Some of the things that I believe that sh can and should be done, we need background checks on all types of sales. It should not only be on federally licensed sales, um, and second thing we should do with background checks is to make sure that the information is reported to the databases. Um, in many cases, a key information is not reported, so it can't function in the way that it's supposed to. A, very, a, a horrible example of that was the Texas church shooter, Devin Kelly, who was able to purchase a firearm, the firearm that he used for this horrendous crime, because the really uh, awful, scary stuff the real violent history was not reported to the database. So the state of Minnesota has to make sure that is reported, and we also have to insist that other states do that. Another practical step that we can do is to have real research, uh, scientific, impartial, politically independent research about the causes and consequences and possible remedies of firearm violence. Politically, actual research into firearm violence has been blocked for too long. We need to do that. Um, there are many other things we could talk about with this, but that would be a beginning. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the use of uh, cell phones while driving. That got a lot of attraction uh, at the mm -hmm. uh, legislature. They ended up not voting on it. Uh, it didn't uh, get passed into law, uh, but it got a lot of attention. So if, if the bill comes up again, banning the use of handheld phones while driving, would you support a bill for that or not? Or where do you stand yes. on that? Absolutely. I would support that bill. Okay. How about you, Lisa? I would also support that. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's could, I, could, could I come to something about education? Absolutely. However, yeah. Yes, uh -huh. because uh, I am by profession a teacher. This is my life, my life work. And uh, to me, education is our promise that every child will have an equal chance, a fair chance, regardless of their family background, regardless of whether they're from a poor family, a rich family, or in between, and that's a promise we have to keep. I wanted to um, – I agree with Lisa about the inequality of funding in our school districts, and I'd like to give you some actual figures on that. In one of the wealthy uh, uh, suburban districts, Lancaster, 
between the operating revenue and their additional levies, they were able to spend $10,449 uh, per student. In the Eden Valley District, which is in, uh, in District 13A, it's $7,049. That's an enormous difference in the, in the consequences that, that translates into sports, it translates into programs. Um, the state funding, the state contribution to education funding has been slipping since 2003. In 2003, the state contributed 75% of the revenue and only 19% came from local property taxes. Today, the state contributes only 67%, which means that 27% of that comes from local property taxes. And the, we come from districts that are not property rich. Um, many of this is residential property, farm property. So uh, we, to equalize uh, the, the uh, educational opportunities throughout the state, which is a goal that I think Lisa and I share, uh, we have to change that funding part of it. We have to go back to the way that we funded education uh, in 2003, which goes back to the Minnesota miracle back in the 1970s that said we were going to make sure that uh, education was adequately and fairly funded throughout the state. I wanted to make sure I got yeah. that in because I'm a teacher by profession, and this is really important. Well, to you're me. also tr strongly connected yeah. to education, yeah. so I'm sure you probably yes. agree on a lot of those yeah. issues. And speaking of uh, one of the, you know, the St. Saint Joseph Township, the city of St. Joseph is part of your district, which is also part of District 742. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can address that, Lisa. Uh, district 742, of course, has unique challenges because of uh, a lot of uh, non-English learning speakers. They have a lot of other special needs kids in the district. Uh, talk a little bit about maybe how you would maybe address District 742 education-wise to maybe switch up the formula, as Jim said, to to give them a more level playing field. Sure. Our students that come in um, either new to country or don't have English as their first language at home are a little bit at a disadvantage in our learning style. And so what we could do is focus on that pre-kindergarten, that early education, both for the students to get them um, where they need to be English um, as English speakers, and then also putting support around the families too, because the families are going to need to have a better understanding of how the students are going to be learning, how they can support their students, and if we need to have that translated into a language that's best understood for those parents, I think that's a service that we can offer for the success of the children, which then um, equates into success of the families, too. All right. We started the conversation. We're almost out of time already, but uh, we started the conversation talking about uh, civility and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly had a nice conversation mm -hmm. here. You guys uh, just got your talking points out as opposed to talking at each other. Uh, as the campaign goes on, I'm sure you guys are going to cross paths many times mm -hmm. uh, and obviously talk a little bit about your approach between now and November. Where do you want to go from here, Lisa? Yep. Um, so I will still continue being out at the doors. I started um, in in June, but um, doing a number of um, parades and the festivals. Now focusing on township meetings, city hall meetings. I know um, Mr. Reed and I have a couple of forums coming up, and I completely agree with the civility piece in politics. I don't think anyone needs to be unkind to get their point across. And like I've said at the doors and I've said to different people that I've met, um, when I'm elected, I look forward to serving all the people in District 13A. There's no reason for me not to be kind. We don't have to agree on everything, but I think kindness can play a huge part in politics. And Jim, talk a little bit about uh, your campaign the rest of the way as well. I will continue going door to door uh, until the eve of the election. It's more challenging now that I'm back teaching full time and also department chair, political science department chair. So squeezing in the door knocking is more challenging than before. It also gets dark earlier than before. But I will go out if I need to at 3.30 in the afternoon or 3 in the afternoon. Um, after it gets dark, I will go uh, and door knock in the, the dormitories of the College of St. Benedict. Um, I As people get closer to the election, uh, more and more people recognize, begin to recognize uh, that this is an important election. When I started door knocking back in, I started door knocking in November of 2017, and uh, for most people, the election was far, far away from their minds. Now they're starting to catch up with our own its sense of urgency and excitement about the election, and I look forward to the path from here, and I look forward to the conversations that Lisa and I will have 
at the forums as we talk about the, the important issues facing our district. All right. Once again, we've been visiting with the two candidates running for House District 13A, Lisa Damoth uh, from Cold Spring of the Republican, uh, Jim Reed uh, from Avon, the Democrat. Thank you both for coming in today. I really appreciate thank it. Jim, thank you.